going to get something out of this. I, I've known Delbert since 2001. We both started our master's degree together, he in trumpet performance and me in composition. Uh, we were in a klezmer band together. We were in another weird band together. The two of us painted the music librarian's house to make it so we could eat one summer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's an amazing musician. Uh, those of you that have seen my solo show, the idea for talking about all the pieces beforehand came from Delbert. Um, he has a master's in trumpet performance. That's how I that's how I first figured out that this was actually a profession. And I actually didn't even know that mixing was even a thing until I until I got out here and was um, started working at a studio. And so it, it was one of those things like, oh, I've been mixing my entire life as a musician. You you're sitting in grooves, you're you're controlling your volume and how you're playing and your timbre and all this stuff. And you're, you know, vibing with other people. And by nature, that's just what musicians do when they play in groups is we're, we're just constantly mixing ourselves. And so. It was like a, a perfect fit for me. So I started working at a studio here in Los Angeles called Larrabee Studios, uh, which is only mixing. And at the time, I didn't know that. So I just was looking for a studio to internship at that to see if I wanted to do this as a full-time career. And so after I started interning, and uh, then you move up to runner and so forth. And so I haven't stopped doing mixing. So I've been doing mixing now for about, um, geez, I guess maybe six or seven years now. And so that's what I do. I'm a full-time mixer, freelance mixer on my own. Keep going, baby. You didn't freeze. Okay. You? I wasn't sure. You guys all kind of stopped on me. I wasn't sure if I got disconnected. So yeah, that, so that's it. Yeah. So I started working at a mixing studio and started out at, at a free job. You know, as an intern, which most, which is the traditional sense, is that most people. You know, the traditional way is that people start at a studio and they work at the lowest rung and then you move up and then you get a little bit more money where you get some money and then you move up to the next level. So in my situation, it started out as internship. So I was working like 40 hours a week um, for free for about a year. And then I worked for about six months as a runner, which is the next step up. And the difference is that you get paid for one of them and you don't get paid for the other one. It's minimum wage. And then I started, um, well, strangely enough, what happened is that Larrabee started building a new tracking room. They're primarily all mixing rooms. And so they built, started building a new tracking room. And in that room, they had a um, SSLG console. And all the other consoles in the entire studio were SSL uh, K consoles. And so I, I took it upon myself to know the G console better than anybody else that was there because I saw it as a way of being, you know, indispensable to, uh, to Larrabee. And so I learned the G console and... And knew it better than anybody else. And so when the room finally opened, you know, it was an obvious choice that they would take the person who knew the console the best. And so they threw me in there and I did assisting in that room for, um, <clears throat> let's see, I don't know, four or five months maybe as assistant in there. And then um, the way it happens in the mixing world is that <clears throat> all, the, all the top mixers have one or two people that work underneath them and kind of helps keeps the train on the tracks, you know, and so. Every so often, like maybe once every two or three years, one of those people will leave, and then they'll pull somebody from the from the studio pool and move them up to that. So you're kind of like a you're still an assistant, but you're more like attached to one person. So every day that Manny would work, who was my boss, I would come in and work as well, or I'd already be there working by the time he got there. But I was a specifically only attached to him, so I wasn't having to deal with the tracking stuff anymore. And so I was with him for about. <clears throat> excuse me for two and a half years we probably did about 2,000 mixes he's the type of dude that does a lot of mixes um all the time and then after that you know you, you the next step is either you stay with that dude or or you go work for someone else or you branch out and do your own thing and so I decided to branch out and do my own thing and and now I'm a freelance mixer I have no boss other than the people that hire me Sounds very good. Does anybody have any questions about that? Steven has a microphone. <laughs> Lily, do you have a question? You're shaking your head yes. Wait, what yeah, questions help because I don't know what to talk about, what you guys are interested in. We could do. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amir, and um, you. this isn't really like related to mixing, just about getting your yeah. foot in the door. Um, that obviously seems like a tough thing to do. How did you take care of yourself while working 40 hours a week for free? Yeah, you little pampered <laughs> princess. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in short, student loans. 
Ah, okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you have school during the time. All right. So, I mean, to, to answer your question, I mean, a lot of the people that were working for free had other side gigs. So the, the internship was not necessarily their full-time job, but they had a very flexible side job as well. Okay. Because the, the deal is, is that when you work for a studio, um, even though they're not paying you anything, they expect you to be there every, any time they need you to be there. So you need to have a secondary job that is really flexible and will allow you to be like, I can't come in tonight. I have to go to the studio and that other job be cool with that. And a lot of people had those sorts of jobs where, you know, it was kind of, they weren't high, uh, reliability intensive or anything like that. They were just kind of, you know, like Starbucks jobs or something like that. Okay. So they would blow those other jobs off to go to the studio. So if you're going to do this for a career and you, and you start out by interning or starting at a studio, you, you have to make yourself available a hundred percent to the studio. You have to treat it like it's your primary job because it is, you know, that's your career. The other job is just a job. So I never said no. Anytime they asked me to be there, I was there regardless of what was going on in my personal or, or schoolwork or any of that stuff. I was, I was there. I would just blow everything off to be there. Cause if you say no, someone else is going to say yes. And then the other person that said yes is going to be the reliable one. And that's going to be the one that people get to know better. And so it's really kind of like a, um, you know, it's no secret. You're not going to make a lot of money in music. So they want to find out the people who are there just because they think it's cool to be in a studio versus the people that have uh, the disease and have to be there, like the passion to be there. And so if you don't fall into the latter category of if, like being a passion, like you have, it's either this or I'm not, or I'm going to be working at McDonald's type of philosophy. Um, then they'll weed you out pretty quick because they only want the most serious diehard people. Okay. And like what I yeah. tell my students is substitute teaching. Basically, they call you in the morning. If you have something to do, you don't have to do it, right? So, I mean, there's like no commitment. It's 100 bucks a day. It's a very easy way to have life after college if you want to pursue, like, goals. Obviously, there's not a lot of money over the summer, but there are, like, so my, work, my wife works at the uh, Severe Autism School in Stafford. They always have a need for substitute teachers because nobody wants to take those jobs. But it's $100 a day. Um, and then over the summer, because it's harder to get people, I think they pay like $150 a day. But, I mean, that's in. They call you in the morning, hey, can you come in? That's it. So you just need to yeah. find something that flexible so that you can make it through this. Or um, I've had people that had relatives in Nashville that lived in their basements, you know, or just somebody that really likes you and would, you know, wants to live vicariously through you finding your dream or something like that. Why are you pointing <laughs> at the two of us? I have no way to support you, Ahad. <laughs> so are there any other questions or oh danny can you take it back to danny big steve say hello oh sorry no i was talking to danny shea in the back sorry uh what kind of music are you mixing or who are you mixing for what do you typically mix are you mastering is that what you're really doing mainly um that's a good question i mix anybody that wants to be mixed um if you want to be uh, a mixer or a mastering engineer in this business, really the only two things that pay the bills that, that record labels are looking for is pop and hip hop. Every now and then you'll get a rock something that comes through, but that's very, very rare. Um, so I try to be a bit of a chameleon in that I don't have a specific, specific type of genre that I'm known for. That way it, kind of, it doesn't close off any, um, any type of uh, you know work that may come your way because it's really easy, especially in the music industry, to get pigeonholed into one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a little bit about that is like when I left Larrabee and was going to do my own thing, I thought, oh well, I'll start out as a tracking engineer and slowly try to work my way back up to being a mixer. But because I'd worked with Larrabee and Manny for so long, I was just already pigeonholed into a mixing as a mixer. I had I would get no recording gigs. Um, I would just get entirely mixing gigs because that's the way people thought of you. Or thought of me and so um in the industry it's real easy to get pigeonholed into like you're you're a hip-hop guy or you're a pop guy or you're a rock dude which is not good from a business perspective because you know you're 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 limiting yourself on what you could be mixing or working on so i try to keep a, a kind of an even kill of what i mix so to answer your question i mix whoever wants to come to me and work with me i, I don't really ever say no even still unless um Unless the, the payment and the what I perceive like the intent of the music to be, if it's below like my certain personal and professional level. 
I'm Meaning, actually, for example, um, it's not necessarily about the money, but if someone has a lot of money behind the song, I know they're going to release it, right? And they're going to put it out and other people are going to listen to it, which then could potentially drive more people my way for more business. Um, but if they don't have the money and I still get the sense that they are still going to do that and it could potentially be good for me, um, I, mean, I know this is so narcissistic, but like if it's going to be heard by people and I think it has a potential to like be interesting to people and drive more business to me, then I'll work on it regardless of the, of the amount of money. Wow. So it's kind of like a, an intent. So if, uh, to answer your question in an obtuse way, um, I don't really I, – I mix everything. I've done hip-hop, ja uh, not jazz. It kind of sounds like funky indie stuff and pop, a lot of pop because that's what record labels are into is just pop, pop, pop. How much do you normally charge for a mix? <laughs> um, my so, – so a little bit about salaries about mixers is that, you know, you can work for free. Um, if you're going to be mixing or being in this industry as a tracking engineer or anything like that, I encourage you never, ever to give your services away for free. And so the reason for that is people perceive value in what you ask for. So if I was to sell you a Ferrari for a hundred bucks, you probably wouldn't be expecting much from that Ferrari. You would probably expecting to get a hundred dollars worth of use out of that Ferrari. But if I sold you the same Ferrari for a hundred thousand, you would probably perceive the value of that Ferrari to be, to be, better than the hundred dollar Ferrari, even if they're the same car. So a lot of this has to do with perception. So whenever you're starting out in this and you, you got people that want to come to you, I always encourage people to always ask for some value of money. And it's better to set your price point above most people's heads so that you can then come down and, um, uh, well, I, you know, you can come down in your, in your offering or your asking price. So salaries can run from anywhere from like pizza and beer all the way up to the top mixers. And the top mixers, uh, those are the cats that, you know, that if you open any of the major label artists that are on the radio right now, they generally have mixed the single. So those cats do somewhere between five and seven thousand dollars per song, plus a one percentage point of the take of that song. So if a song makes one hundred thousand dollars, they would get one percent of that one hundred thousand dollars. But now, isn't there a caveat for this if they're living where they live now? I mean, do you think that they should always charge even if they're, say, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, or, like, offer value for their service? You know what I'm saying? I mean, because you're from a small town in Tennessee. I mean, it's yeah. not like if every band was coming up to you and you're like, let's start at 2000 and talk me down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you know, when you first start out, you. so after I left Larrabee, I was asking for $1,000 per mix. And I would generally get somewhere between five and seven hundred dollars for the mix per song. And honestly, I mean, maybe that's just because it's LA. That was pretty easy to get, to be honest with you. Um, since then, since I've had a string of hits and Grammy nominated, my price point is twenty five hundred per song and one uh, percent. And so, surprisingly, that hasn't been a problem either. And I don't know if that's just because of LA or the people that I work with, but. That hasn't seemed to be the case either. So it's, it's, you know, honestly, like, if you want to do this for, for a career music industry, there's really three places, maybe four places that you need to go to. And I hate to say that, but it's Los Angeles, Nashville, New York, or Atlanta. And depending on what type of music you want to do will help determine which one of those markets you want to go into. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what the rates are going like there in, in your area. Honestly, just ask for it. And if people don't have the money for it, then you say, well, listen, that's what I would like to get. What is your budget? And so you always come back with a, what is your budget? And they'll tell you what the budget is. And then you can decide if that's a price point you're willing to do, because it's not going to be any easier for you. <laughs> Whether you do a mix for a $500 or $5,000, it's generally about the same amount of work every single time. It's a full probably 12 hours of, of, well, when I do it, 12 hours of my time to work on a song. And so the price isn't, I don't really get caught up so much on the price as, like I was saying before, is the intent of, is this something that's actually going to be released? Because so many people do music and it just sits there and it never goes anywhere. That doesn't really benefit you as, well, it doesn't benefit me as a mixer for someone to, to pay $2,000 and the song to sit there on the shelf and do nothing. I'd rather, hell, I'd rather do it for $500 and you release the song so people can hear it. Yeah, ain't that the truth? No, last two records I've done haven't been. I mean, I've got a record coming up now, but the last two records, 
they they were released but weren't even pushed and so it's real you don't really yeah. get anything out of it when you do i mean and at least not from the mix perspective but from like doing all the tracking doing the mixing doing the mastering i mean you're talking hundreds of hours of work that result yeah. in zero huh well no it's not that i mean when you want Did that answer i mean everything i do now is basically i i'm a slave to my students so basically, I try to pick out projects that when my students are assistants on them, it's going to get them stuff. So like last year, four different projects or four different students were part of two different projects that were on the Grammy ballot. Like that's a I mean, that's nice. But at the same time, that doesn't even matter compared to what if 7000 people heard, you know, one track each off of those two records. That's going to be more important because then. When you're looking at it and you're an artist, you're like, well, hey, I want to hire these people to record my record or I want to hire these people to mix my record. And that's how I can make it so my students get pushed along. Like so when Becky was working in the studio and got hired to be a tour manager because, right, the record company president was so impressed with what she was doing in the studio, they hired her. Like so I have a totally different agenda than Delbert because I'm subsidized by the state. I'm a teacher. I would like to make money, but I don't have to. What's more important for me is to project my students forward, but it's the same thing he's yeah. talking about. I mean, somebody can offer me $10,000. I only have time to make maybe three or four records a year. Even if they offer me $10,000, well, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I'm so impoverished, I'm gonna take that. But let's say like two grand or something like that. If it's not gonna help my students, it just doesn't, and I have something that's gonna help students, that's worth more of my time. Yeah, your time is valuable, and, and you'll find that a lot of people are willing to waste your time. So you have to be kind of careful on on weeding those people out pretty quickly. Unless you're just starting out, and then when you're just starting out doing anything, like tracking or anything like that, just be hungry and, and, and go for it, you know? It, it's almost, because so much of this is a, is, 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 is a craft, it is an art. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And when you first start out doing it, you're just... You just want to get your hands on everything that you can. Every single situation that you can put yourself into, that's what you need to be doing is. So you need to be mixing anything. I've, I've mixed, I, I mixed a whole bunch of garbage when I was still working at Larrabee just so I could have hands on with, with people's stuff and be working with them. Well, Ahad's been working with his music, so he's totally used to that too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, did that, did that answer your question, Mark, about the prize? I mean, well, it, I, yeah, I mean, I sort of led you into that because I knew the answer to it, but I just sort of wanted them to know the answer to that. So, yes, you were perfect. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm a good, I'm a good straight man for you, baby. <laughs> um, why don't, did you have a question, Lily? Okay. Big Steve? Um, hi, I'm not sure if, like, if it's possible, but like, what are kind of like your procedures when you're tackling a song? Um, like, what are things like you look out for to like have a, so a song sound like very professional and, and something like you would hear on the radio? Um, I know I'm finding now, I've just started, but you know, it's really difficult to have songs like sound like they, they were, you know, done professionally and have them sound good and you know, from phone speakers to laptop speakers to, like, headphone speakers. Um, like, do you have, like, I don't know, like, a diagram that you go through? Like, you hear something and you just, like, kind of tackle it in, like, that order? That do you mean, like, what you? does he start mixing first? Yeah, like, uh, Or is it, what does he listen for? It sounds like there might be three questions in this one yeah, question. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> I think I can answer that one, Mark. All right. You're the you're better so, than All right, so the very first thing that I do um, – so let me just kind of walk you through my little basic procedure of how I, I do this type of thing, right? Okay. Uh-oh. Did I cut out? No, no. You're, Audio-wise, you're still here. Okay. <laughs> um, and there's a picture of you on the right and a picture of us in front of a Pro Tools session on the left. Oh? Oh, really? Weird. Okay. Uh, so so here's, here's the thing is um, – Whenever, as a mixer, so I'm talking primarily from a mixing standpoint here, right? So whenever someone gives me a mix, I always ask for what they call a reference mix. And I don't know if Marx has talked to you about reference mixes. But reference mixes are as good as the client can get it, meaning the, either the tracking engineer has done it or the producer has done it. But it is as good of a mix as they're possibly ever going to be able to get with, with their time and their skills. So when they give me the session, right, 
uh, meaning all the files and everything, uh, I always I have to have that reference mix before I'll ever even start working on the song. And so the first thing I do is I listen to the reference mix. I listen to what the what their what their version of the song already is, because um, as a mixer, your role is not to come in there and be a producer. That's not my job. So I don't get in there and add a delay here and pan this on this side and and rework the drums and all that type of stuff. That's not that is not the goal. That is not the job of the mixer. The job of the mixer is to take the artistic vision that's already there and bring it closer to where you perceive it needs to be. So when people hire a mixer, they're hiring the person for their taste, their musical taste, right? So the first thing I do is I listen to that reference mix and I get the vibe of it. How does the song make me feel? Um, what does it remind me of? Do I have a, a mental image of what I think they're trying to go for? And I, I hold on to that through the entire time that I'm mixing, meaning um, once you get into mixing, all the EQs and all this little technical stuff can really start to eat away at you. And then all of a sudden you've got a, song, you got a, sounding, a mix that sounds nothing like what you envisioned it to. So when I first get a track, I just get a reference mix, and I, I listen to it for a is this, is this a happy song, sad song? Does this make me want to go to Vegas? Does this make me want to go to Atlantic City? Does this make me want to go, I don't know, to Hawaii? Does this make me want to call my mom? And I use that the entire time that I'm mixing as the creative North Star, is what I call it. Meaning, any time, let's say, for example, a song makes me want to go to Vegas, right? Right. And I'm working on the song, and I'm mixing, and I'm going for it. At any time, it makes me want to feel like I want to go to, to Reno, right? I've messed up as a mixer. So I, I undo. I go back and, and undo all the stuff that I've done and then try to take it get back on the path to going to Vegas because those are two different, completely different vibes. And so when people hire a mixer, they're really looking for your taste and see if you get the artist's vision. So I take that reference mix, and I listen to it a few times, and I listen to like the overall vibe, and then I listen for things that I don't like. And that's the other thing about being a mixer is you have to be an opinionated jerk. Um, hopefully, your opinion's okay, right, and it doesn't get you in trouble. But you have to be kind of you have to be pretty nitpicky with with things. Saying, "Oh, I really don't like the way that vocal sounds because of X. I don't like the I like the snare placement, but I don't like the way that the kick drum sounds." And so, so I get those kind of overall ideas in my head as soon as I'm listening to that reference mix. And then when I dive into it, I just keep that creative North Star on in the forefront of my mind the entire time and try to work towards getting the song a little bit closer to that goal. So it, and some songs it needs a lot of work and some songs it needs a little bit of work, you know, to to use a sports metaphor. Sometimes it's on the 40 yard line and I got to get it to the touchdown. And sometimes it's on the one yard line, depending on where the song is at. And so sometimes the mixes are, <coughs> excuse me are quite a bit different that I that I put out versus the reference and sometimes they're you might be hard pressed to put a, your finger exactly on what it is I've done to it but you know it does sound better but you're not exa entirely sure why so it can it can run the gamut the other thing that I look for is loudness and <laughs> uh, I mean people talk about I don't know Mark have you ever talked to them about the loudness wars and stuff like that yeah well I mean that's one of the things we talked about with the automation with how as you can see from your main track there, that there's no dynamic diversity within the track at all. Yeah, so the loudness wars are over. Loud one. Okay, so your song has to be radio ready as soon as it comes off of my Pro Tools rig. It has to be like, it's something loud. It is, um, it's as mastered as a mastering engineer 20 years ago would have done to it. Mastering engineers do something completely different nowadays. They work, they work more with like the stereo out on the outer edges of the stereo field and do tweaking out there, but it's loud. It's really loud. And so that's what people want when they put your song on. And what a lot of them will do is listen to the reference and then they'll listen to your song, your mix, and they'll flip back and forth. You cannot lose in any category. Yours has to be louder than the reference. Even if their reference is screaming loud, yours has to be louder. If theirs has a nice punchy bass, yours has to have an even better punchy bass. If it has a nice thudding kick drum, you have to have an even thuddier kick drum. So you have to beat it in every single category in order for people to stick around with you. <coughs> Otherwise, they'll just bounce and go to the next mixer and you'll just be left there with all your time and energy in a, in a song that you've worked on and you won't get anything out of it. They'll just not call you back and just disappear. Happens all the time. Well, not to me, but it happens all the time in the industry.
Oh, Evan, can you take the thing back to Evan, Stephen? Did that answer your question? If, if I don't answer your question, just say, hey, you missed the point completely. Did get it? Yeah, she said that... yeah. What's she saying? Something from Evan, and then maybe you could, like, talk about some techniques, too. <laughs> sure. Go, Evan. <laughs> What's my name, Mark? Yeah, you go. What's my name? Oh, Ethan. <laughs> Thank Evan. You. Yeah, so... Uh, I was just curious, like, what's the turnaround time typically that you have to get these songs mixed and mastered? Um, so mastering, I don't know what, I don't know what, you know, I don't do the mastering, but my songs are like pretty, they're pretty loud, pretty. I don't know if you can see in the Pro Tools here. They're, they're basically a little block wave. Let me, let me, can I make this smaller? Well, this one's not so bad actually, but most of them were just little Lincoln logs sitting there, so. Um, <clears throat> turnaround time can depend on the client. Generally for me, it takes me about 12 hours of just doing the first pass. So I go through it and you can kind of, you can kind of see in this thing, I'll go through it and nitpick and add my, everything that I need, do any automation that I feel like I need. And that generally takes about 12 hours. There's the lead vocal right there. So you can see that there's just a ton of edits that has been put into that lead vocal there. Um, so about 12 hours, depending is maximum that I'll spend on it and then I'll move on. But then the next part is that you send them your mix and just like everybody in music, you give them one thing, everybody has an opinion. So I could play a song for you and everybody in here will have an opinion of what needs to be changed or what doesn't sound right to their ears and then I'll ask to fix it. So then we go back and forth with the notes process and that literally can take as long as it takes. I've literally started, I'm working with a group of guys right now and we started the project in last March. So we're coming up on a year and it's still not finished. So it's back and forth, the updates and the notes. And actually change this. Can you nudge this? Can you can you do this? And so it, it can take anywhere from your first pass, which is 12 hours of your actual work, to a full year or more. You're not happy as a mixer until the client's happy because you want them to come back and you want them to recommend you to their friends and their, their peers. So it's, it's a very service-oriented... Uh, um, career all right thank you yeah one more but then let's talk let's talk okay. about music you know how i love to talk uh, about music how do you win this loudness war what do you specifically do when you're mixing a track to make it a danny is small? obsessed with loudness just so you know i crush it to death with a with a limiter in fact i actually use two limiters on most of my mixes so on the um tracks or on like singular tracks uh, what what's that on the master track yeah, on the master. So right here, so all my audio in my entire session, can you see that on the screen? Yeah. So all of my audio eventually hits what I call my, my input track here, which is basically my stereo bus, right? And so you can see here I have a saturation, I have a compressor, but basically the last thing that happens every single time, well, this one, <laughs> check. so this one actually, so there's my limiter, right? And so... Yeah, so so I crush yeah, it with yeah, a limiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what I do. Okay. It broke up a little bit there. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of breaking up here too a little bit, so I don't know if there's something going on with the Wi-Fi. Um, but I, I crush it with a limiter. And in fact, nowadays, I don't even have just one limiter. I actually have another limiter after this one. And this was kind of an odd bird because... so. If you know the signal flow in Pro Tools, so the signal comes into this input aux, goes through all these plugins, and then comes out through here through the volume. And you can see that I'm even writing the volume up after all the plugins. And so I've even trimmed it. Yeah, I've even trimmed it up here. So I'm just pressing as hard as I can into this third chorus here in order to kind of make it super, super loud and super, super. Uh, I don't want to say distorted, but we're we're in we're in a gray, we're in a gray area of music of how loud can you get it without the general public hearing it being distorted? Do you normally put your effects? And the answer is it's pretty loud. <laughs> Danny, I think you're going to need to speak up both for us put and your for him. Effects chain in a certain order, like the limiters at the end, and where do you put the EQ? And I see you have ozone. Do you always put yeah. ozone in a certain place? Like what order do you do your chain normally? Sure. Does it matter? So I could just I can just show you how I kind of have it in my mind set up. So. So check it out. So I have all the music stuff. So yellow is drums, and these are all drums. Um, and then I have bass and, and instruments. Now all the instruments, so everything but a vocal is going to my, this music aux that I have. 
So it's kind of it's aux before my input. In which case, a lot of times nowadays I actually have the uh, the Slate virtual tape machine on that, so it gives some tape saturation. Same way with the vocals, they're all the vocals are going to an aux, and then both of those auxes are then fed into my stereo bus. So on my stereo bus, I have um, the Slate Virtual Mix Bus, which is a console emulator, so it adds some of the harmonics and stuff that you would get from a console. Um, and it's a really good plugin. I'm actually using the version one of, of that plugin because they changed it a little bit up in version two and did some things that I don't particularly like. So I have this little console thing for saturation on, on this master stereo bus. Okay, so that's pretty standard. Most people kind of have some sort of saturation. So here's here's where mine's a little bit different. And the problem with Pro Tools is that you can get so screaming loud, right, that your compressor's needles won't do anything but just kind of float and so you get this like constant compression even when you don't want the constant compression does that make sense so so normally when you see an analog compressor and you see people use it the needles move right and so in pro tools you can get it so loud coming off of the tracks that the needle won't really go back to resting point it'll just stay floating in midair and so what i actually do is put a trim and i cut it down there and you can see 6 db so i cut it basically in half in volume so I knock the volume of it way, way down so that my next thing, which is a compressor, <clears throat> can actually function like a compressor. Now, the, the actual plugins that I use change depending on what the song is calling for. Um, but the SSL comp is, is one of my favorite. It's the Waves version of it. And so when I'll just see if I can get it. To, I'm going to mute it here, but I just want you to kind of see what's going on with the needle. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll work. Yeah, the frame rate is not going to make it work, maybe. Yeah. So so anyway, basically, my needle just kind of, it kind of pulses with the music, so under 4 dB. If I didn't have that trim, that needle would just be floating in outer space there, up higher than I want it to, and you get this kind of weird, like, you know, it's when, it's when the song sounds like this, and it can't get any louder, and it's because it's pushing against the compressor. So I kick everything down, and then I hit my different, you know, different plugins. So in this case, I got Ozone 5. I don't know what I was doing on this track. It's probably it's probably a harmonic exciter and some sort of stereo width thing that's going on. It's just spinning here for me. <clears throat> it came up eventually. Yeah. I don't know what's going on here. It's, it's moving pretty sluggish. Yeah, so I just have a little EQ. I just EQs on this one, actually. Actually, one EQ. And I'm just doing a little bit of shaping. You know, pretty typical EQ line that you would see in most mixes, uh, bag of tricks, the little smiley face, the hype curve is what I call it, where the tops are up and the tails are up and everything else is left as is. And so then I go into a, I go into this Brainworks hybrid EQ, um, and I've never, ever used it as an EQ in my entire life. I've never used it as an EQ. The only thing that I use this plugin for is this little knob up here, the stereo width knob. And so... I just stretch it out a little bit so it's wide. Um, you know, in mixing, you're looking for width, height, which is frequency, and then you're looking for depth. So with like some some sort of dimensions of space with reverbs and delays and sitting things back and forefront in the mix, those types of things. So you're looking for like an overall thing. I like this plugin because most most stereo width plugins will start to pull the center apart. So the wider you make it, all of a sudden now your kick drum and everything that lives in the middle starts to disappear. I found that you can pull this in pretty far without losing that center line of your mix. And so obviously you can pull it so that it wraps around behind your head, but you can pull it pretty good with this one and keep your center stuff in the center. So you can make it wider, uh, which gives it also the illusion that things are louder. So it's only going to help you as a mixer because your song is automatically going to be wider and bigger than the reference mix, but simply because you pull it apart just a little bit. <clears throat> then I have an EQ. Um, this is EQ that, uh, I, when I worked with Manny, we helped, I helped work on this EQ. And so the way this EQ is set up is that every single one of these knobs, every one of these bands is based on a different type of actual hardware EQ. And so the, the top one is based off the Avalon EQ of the 2033 or 2044. I forget which one it is. And so I just add more top end because modern music is all about how much top end can you put into it? Um, without getting into the harsh factor. And then very simply, I trim it back up. So whatever I trimmed it down here, so I duck it down in volume, it hits all these plugins at a reasonable level, and then I just bring it back up in volume, and then I hit my, my limiter. And so that's how I have things set up on my stereo bus. And 
it works pretty well. I mean, it'll change. My stereo bus has changed in in the past. Uh, and really, the things that change are what I'm going on in ozone, and then what EQ or sorry, what compressor I'm using on the stereo bus, and what kind of song it is. So different songs have different types of vibes. If it's a warmer type of song, kind of more soul or John Mayer or something like that, I may not use the SSL comp. I may use like a very mu or something like that. So it really just depends on the song. Does that does that answer some yeah, of your questions? That was, that was awesome. Um, do you <laughs> do you a lot of times you use uh, ozone just for the EQ? Um, yeah, yeah, I find myself, I use it quite a bit for EQ because it has a, a little graph and I can see the little, the little squiggly lines and what's going on from a visual perspective. And it's also not too heavy handed if you use it moderately. I like, I like that it has a, a fine attention to detail and when anything you put on the stereo bus, you have to use it super conservative because you have to imagine that you're applying that compression to every single one of your tracks. That EQ is being applied to every single one of your tracks. So when things on the stereo bus should be put on there, and you should use them super, super conserved. Less is more on the stereo bus. And last question. Do you think you can make things – because I use Ableton mainly and Logic. Do you yeah. think – do you use Pro Tools more often? Can you make things louder when you're mastering it in Pro Tools than you can other plugin or other DAWs like Logic? Like should I get Pro Tools to master is what I'm saying? What do you want to do? You want to master? Well, I'll just master my music, make it as loud what do you, as possible. I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to write music or do you want to mix music? I both write my own music and mix it. Well, I mean, honestly, I don't know a mixer that uses anything but Pro Tools. Every mixer that I've ever worked with uses Pro Tools. Um, I use exclusively Pro Tools. If somebody's working in Logic or Ableton, I'll have them send me the session, and then I bounce it out one track at a time. And then I import it into Pro Tools and put it all back together and, and try to match what, what's going on in their session. Um, but I don't know the answer to that because okay. I've only ever used Pro Tools, to be honest with you. And that kind of is like the Microsoft Word of the, of the industry, whether you like it or not. Okay. Mastering people, though, it's rare to find someone in, in mastering inside of Pro Tools. Most mastering engineers that I know of work inside a, a program called Sequoia, which is super expensive. And that's what they use. Thank you. Yeah. So I don't, I don't. To answer your question, honestly, whichever one feels best to you. If you're going to want to do this professionally, though, you need to buy Pro Tools because, hate it or love it, it is what everybody uses, and that's what most of the people you'll run into are using and are comfortable with. Unfortunately, I agree. But yeah. I, I do not. Pro Tools. I like. I would never ever mix in Pro Tools because I hate Pro Tools for mixing. But it's the best tracking. To me, it's the best for tracking. You can't beat it. It's the best tape machine replacement. Well, the nice thing about Pro Tools is that every plugin is generally made for, to work inside of Pro Tools. So you never run across a, a you don't run across very very many situations where something has been made only for Logic and it has a, there's no Pro Tools version of it. Oftentimes, you'll run into where there's a Pro Tools version but no Logic version or no Ableton version. Because all those manufacturers, those plug-in manufacturers, want to sell to the most number of people, and most number of people are using Pro Tools. That's not to say um, that people don't use the other stuff, and a lot of producers use Ableton and and Logic and stuff like that. But you know, just the kid in, sitting in Kansas City that's wanting to get into music, probably the first thing they'll buy is, is a copy of the of Pro Tools, or they'll pirate it. Yeah. All right. Well, do you want to show something on that mix? Sure, I don't know if it was playing though. Was it playing? Oh, is it playing now? Well, just try it. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they think, I think they said you couldn't talk at the same time. Cartland sent me a message saying something about Amazon is destroying the internet today. Um, <laughs> is there a flash sale? Do I need to get off here and go buy something? <laughs> no. He said web <laughs> service is having a massive failure and it's affecting lots of web apps like Skype. And he thinks that's okay. Never, uh, so. No, so well, if I press play here, is it distorted? Life and then your life becomes a better one. I made a man so happy when I rolled a little one. I hope my children come and back. visit once. I mean, can you hear that, Mark? We can hear it, but it has. It just has, instead of being like, it's like, I mean, so the yeah. artifacts are fewer and far between. Right. But they're still there, though, right? They are still there. Yeah. I mean, I just kind of had this session open so you guys can just kind of see 
what a typical session might look like. And this one has a lot more automation than most sessions that I work on. And that's because, um, so this is a song seven years. Um, when, when I was mixing it, they were still producing it. So I would jump in and start mixing and they would kick me off and they would, they would bring in some new strings and then I have to go back through and, and figure out what's going on. So this session has a lot of automation in it. I wonder if I I wonder if I switched over to a session that didn't have as much automation and it would it would be better. Let me let me check it here. You can try. Well, until then, are there any other questions? Yeah, if there's any questions while I'm pulling it up. Paul, do you have any questions? Take the microphone over to Paul. Paul and I went to high school together. He's awesome. <laughs> be nice to him. How are you doing, Delbert? Nice to meet you. Ask him about my history. Thanks, buddy. Oh. <laughs> So, uh, you know, with the advent of cloud computing, uh, you're, we're seeing solutions rolling out from a lot of the, you know, a lot of the um, uh, the DAW makers out there. How prevalent is that becoming in the industry um, at this level, like people collaborating that way and, you know, rather than kind of shipping tracks, you know, either, uh, you know, I don't know, Dropbox or, you know, even like snail mail to each other. I've heard that still happens. Most of the industry people are super paranoid about having stuff leak that they would never use the cloud stuff because they're just too paranoid to use it. So I've not ran across any instances where people have been using the cloud stuff for collaboration. So the uh, so the the issue that you talked about where you're having, um, you know, production is changing out from under you. That's happening because people are like shipping you new session files and so forth. Yeah, you know, here so in in the in the professional industry. Um, people won't even sign the go ahead to send it to mixing unless it's to a good point already. So the, the, that was a rare case because, um, in fact, I don't think the record label knew that the producers were doing that and probably would have flipped the lid had they known that that was happening. Most people don't do that. By the time it comes to the mixer, somebody has said, yes, I'm willing to spend money on this song. Let's send it to a mixer. So once it gets to me, the production stuff has generally already stopped and and sometimes it stopped as much as uh, like six or seven months ago. And so like it's set on someone's lap for a little while and they've listened to it enough to decide, you know, this is not a bad song. I think I'm actually going to go ahead and go through with that. So it's very, very, that's the only time that that's ever happened to me where I've had somebody try to produce while I'm actually still mixing it. Had I known that I would have charged more. Did that answer your question there, buddy? Cool. Man, this thing is taking forever to load. Yeah. It's it's uh it's not liking all of this going on. <laughs> I'm on my laptop too. This is not my everyday working rig. This is a uh, <clears throat> this is my uh portable studio type of thing. Hey, Delbert. Uh, I'm Austin. Um, I had a question. When you finish a mix, uh, what what happens next? And as well, also like, what do you send the person who's responsible for the next mix? Yeah. So 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 after I do my first pass of the mix, they'll they'll write me back, and sometimes a matter of minutes, sometimes a couple of days, or even some weeks. And so they'll have their notes or adjustments that they want me to do, and then I'll I'll do the next pass. I'll make their note adjustments, send it back to them. And that can go on for quite a while. Um, so once the mix is actually done, done, I will send them. Um, so when I send them the songs to listen to, I send them an MP3 version of it, like a high quality MP3. And I send them a 16 bit waveform for them to listen to. And so once they've, once they've said, I'm done with the mix, let's send it to mastering. I will send the mastering engineer the files directly. So I will send them a 24 bit file high resolution pass of their song. Um, I will also send them an instrumental, which is just the instruments. I'll send them a, an acapella, which is just the vocals. Mm -hmm. And then I will send them what we call a TV track. And, and it's basically, it's like a karaoke track where you take out any of the, so pretend you wrote a song, right? And it's, and you're gonna, you have the potential to sing it on the Today Show, mm -hmm. but you actually wanna sing the actual lead line. So <clears throat> what would you need in order to perform that song in live setting? So it's basically everything but the lot, but the lead vocal is muted in the in the track. So you can think of it as like a karaoke song. And so those are the four passes that I will send over to mastering. Those will all be 24 bit and the full sample rate and everything as the session came to me. So that's what I send to them, and 
and then they stick it into their 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 DAW or whatever it is they need to do within it and master it. And then six months later, six to eight months later, you get paid. Hey. Maybe. All right, did it load up or is it still loading? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's loaded. Sorry. Let's see. Is this any better? Yes, of course it did. Can you hear that, Mark? We sure can. Yeah, it's got no, <laughs> no, no artifacts or anything. Okay, cool. So let's see. This is a song I did for an artist overseas. Um, Sabina Dadumba is her name. I worked on this quite a while ago. And you can see on this one that there's not, let me just make this window bigger here. There's not as much automation. There's still some points of automation that happens in it, um, <clears throat> but they're not as crazy as much. So this is this is probably typically what you might see in a situation. So I'll just play it for a little bit. You can listen to it if you have any questions. I'll try to thumb through here, and I don't know if the framework rate will let us look at it, but you can see here to the guy who was asking about my stereo bus, you can see here now I've changed over to an L3 on this one. So. All this stuff will change depending on what's going on and what the song is. So the L3 is a more of kind of a, uh, I don't know if you guys know that the mixer is Um, but that's what he uses for his top end. And so people have been using this and you can see, I just got a little bit of bump in this, you know, 5k up type of thing to add just a little bit more of that top end. Uh, but it's still doing this, the same thing. And then we'll see, just curious who I'm doing an ozone here. Do do do. And it's going to do that thing for me now, huh? Oh, you can see I'm doing some drastic EQing here. There must have been a severe problem going on in this. That's not that's not common at all. And then of course the harmonic slider, which <clears throat> which I really like. And so I just I just tinker around with these bands and and try to figure out what's going to juice it up a little bit. So there's the first little part of that song that I worked on. And you can see just in the waveform, <clears throat> um, obviously everybody knows that the choruses are the most important part of every song, right? And so those choruses, there really needs to be a build towards those choruses. And you can see that part of that build is the volume. And you can see how much squared off they start to get uh, in those choruses, particularly the third chorus. And every pop song, every, every radio song, the third chorus is key to uh, whether or not um, – people enjoy the mix or not, so to speak. And third chorus needs to be the largest of all the courses. Any questions? <laughs> Cole, you work for the newspaper. You've got to have a question. Okay, you don't want to ask him about internships or anything? Danny has a question. You can give it to Danny. Danny's going to ask questions the rest of the time. It's all going to be about how to make his stuff louder than everybody <laughs> yep. else's. All right. So Good. Uh, it should be louder you, than everybody else's. I mean, I'm just used to... Don't like, destroy my poor children, Delbert. I don't master <laughs> a lot. Uh, I'm starting into it, so I only put stuff on the, I guess, master when mm -hmm. I master. Do you, when you're mastering, put stuff on individual tracks? Like, on the vocals, you usually put this kind of plug in, or on this uh, kicks, you put this kind of plug in. You do that. Do you have some kind of workflow you typically stick to? Um, 
So you said mastering. Yeah, you I don't keep master. Mas- he, he's not a mastering engineer. He's a well, mix mixing, engineer. I mean, do you put? Some yeah. Kind of okay. plugins All right. Sorry, you just kind of threw me off there a little bit. Um. So I okay. So the way I look at it is that there's three important elements of a song, and those three important elements of the song are the vocal. The vocal has to always be prominent. It has to be in your face. The whole not necessarily in your face, but it's got to be on top of the mix so that people can hear that. When people buy Rihanna or Katy Perry. They're not buying it to hear what the guitar player is doing, right? They're buying to hear what Katy Perry is singing. So Katy Perry is – vocal is key. Vocal has to be on top every single time. Anytime it gets buried or pushed down into it, and depending on the genre, obviously, it means where it's going to sit in the mix differently. But you never want to lose the vocal. So vocal has to stay on top at all times. Followed next are the drums, right? People like to bob their head and groove. And so drums are second important. And then finally the bass depending on the genre, the level of importance of the bass will, will change, right? Everything else is distant, distant, distant in the, in, in the, in the peripheral of what, what you should be focusing on. Um, people don't care what the guitar is doing. I'm sorry to offend any guitar players. People don't care what the synthesizer is doing. Those are all added elements that come in after, but the three key ones are vocal, drums, and bass. Everything else, you know, is, it would be like me racing Usain Bolt in a sprint, right? I would be every other instrument, and Usain would be those three. So he's always going to win. So I always start with the drums. I get the drums grooving. I get the kick. I get them start kind of rocking. As soon as I find myself bobbing my head, I'll put the bass guitar in or the bass synth and stuff and kind of get kind of get it vibing. And then after that, it's really kind of depending on what, what I feel like are the next level of importance of the song. Sometimes I'll throw the vocal straight in. Other times I'll do all the, all the music and then put in the vocal last. Uh, it just kind of depends on what I feel like it should take. So I don't have a set like I'm always going to use this EQ or those types of things. I have some favorite EQs that I use, um, but it's not always a guarantee that they're going to get on there. It just depends on the song. So some of my favorite EQs, if you if you if people are taking notes and want to just check them out, I really like the um, uh, the Fab Filter stuff for vocals. Um, I like the uh, CL1B soft. Soft Tube, I think, is the name of the company. It's probably on this session here. It's kind of like my go-to um, vocal compressor. And it's based off the CL1B, the TubeTech CL1B, which is a piece of hardware. Um, and then I, I, I will just use various different plugins. So I, I don't really, I don't really have a, a standard one that I'd reach for. It's kind of like whatever, because all the plugins have a different sound, right? It's like. Um, you know, you have cobalt blue and you have light blue and then you have like a more kind of blue mixed with a little bit of orange. So when I'm listening to the music and I say, oh, this this kick drum needs to be fatter. And then almost instantly, uh, one of those plugins will pop into my mind. And that's the plugin that I'll generally start with because I know what the plugins sound like. So this one over here has a fatness quality to it. So I'll bring it in. So it's, it's really... It's kind of like a, a sonic memory, so to speak, you know, because all the plugins have their different sounds. So depending on what I need, I'm, I'm not trying to be obtuse, will we'll de- depend on what I reach for. And after you use these for a long time, you'll just you just start to get to know what what is the API 2500 and Wave sound like versus the UAD version. And then what's the difference between the 2500 and the uh, Decapitator from Sound Toys? You just start to know what those those plugins sound like and depending on whatever aspect you're trying to either enhance or, or fix, that will pop into your head when you're trying to reach for a tool. It's kind of like, you, oh, you reached for this wrench. Why didn't you reach for that wrench? Well, this wrench seems like it would work better than that wrench. Well, who knows why? It just gets imprinted into you. <clears throat> does, that make, does that help you? Yeah, no, that helps a lot. I just have to buy yeah. more plugins. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry I can't be more specific at it because it really is a moving target. Every time I sit down behind something, uh, it's a different producer. It's a different song. It's a different vibe, and all of those things change every time you sit down. That's the beauty of this job is I never get bored of it because every time I sit down to to work on a song, it's a new project and it's a new set of problems, and it's a new kind of um, uh, uh, method of working, so to speak. So it's it's very. I don't like to stick around on things for very long and work on them super super long. That's why I probably would be a terrible tracking engineer. Um, so I, I just move on to the next song, and there's a new set of problems. So it keeps me engaged as a as a problem solver. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. Yeah, do you, have, you have plugins you like, buddy? 
Oh, Danny? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, Danny. I, remember, I use Ozone a lot. I'm trying to get Melodyne. Trying to get Melodyne. Uh, and I usually just have Ableton, so I use a lot of their their basic plugins. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I haven't. that's why I'm asking, because I don't know. Before I start actually spending money on these plugins, like, what's the best of the best? Like, what should I gotcha. try to make the bass big without getting crunchy or, like, well, Wave's no, goal was 199 at. for students or like for everybody there for like a little bit. What? What? Wave's gold, and you get a ton of stuff with those. But I mean, that's when I tell stu like when students are like, I don't like Logic, I don't like any of these other things. I'm like, if you can get gold on the student discount, which when it's not on sale, I think is like 300 bucks, then you get a lot of these things. Not actually what he's talking about, but what will do sort of the same thing. So instead of getting the L3. I think you get the L1 and the L2 with gold. You probably wouldn't know that because you're not a Waves rep, right, Delbert? I think you get the L1, but not the L2. Yeah, I bought, yeah. I bought the, the green bundle. The, um, I think it has the L1. Okay. But, I mean, those yeah. are the things you just start with. Because, I mean, Pro Tools really yeah. doesn't have a lot of plugins to start with, like Logic and DP yeah. and Ableton have. I mean, like, it's pretty stripped down. One uh, plugin I use a lot now is the Stereo Spreader from Waves, the... Stereo one, yes, one imager. Yeah, <coughs> that's that's one of those plugins I was talking about. If you pull it too far, it'll start to disintegrate your center, and you'll lose everything that's going on the center. So be careful how much you use that plugin. That's why I like that Brainworks hybrid. Is and the more you pull it, it still holds its center. Oh, you can see it when I move it up here. You can, it still holds its center. So well, that S one imager, the more you start to pull it, it starts to dissipate, and you start to lose your kick drum and your vocal and everything and the and the bass, everything that lives in the center. So that that stereo width tool is is the or that Brainworks hybrid EQ is the one that I use so that you can start pulling it apart but you keep the center still. The S1 imager is really bad about disintegrating the center, and so yeah. you'll start to pull it and you'll lose your kick drum. I usually only use it on like higher frequencies for that reason. What do you uh What do you use to like? Well, if you got ozone, use use the stereo imager inside of the ozone. That's a better one because you can you can spread the different bands at different uh, different lengths. Okay. Uh. I do. do I only too. so I check it out. Too. So that S1 imager, I, I look at that plugin as a problem solving. So for example, if if someone has given me all their files and I'm listening to the reference and their um their their base in the reference is like this, right? And then I'm listening to it and the base is more like this. So I'll pull out that stereo one imager and bring it back in. So I use it as a problem tool to fix like specific width problems is the way that I, way that I feel about the S1 imager is it's more of a fixing tool than it is kind of an enhancing tool. The ozone stereo imaging stuff is really, really good and you can pull it really far apart and do the different bands. So you should try it out. I think you'll like it better. Oh, well, how do you, other than like reverb or maybe talk about reverb, how do you like to put depth in your mix? Cause I always try to think of like filling up this like, cube with all the sound to give it like a whole yeah. 3d area and i'm not really good at getting the whole back and forward part of the mix got it so so check this out not every song needs that cube yeah right hip-hop doesn't need that type of depth because that's not the, the the vibe and generally the genre traits of that of that of that genre it's not really about a depth hip-hop is more about like a mosaic approach so you take a kick drum from this song and you take the snare from this and and you put in this and things so it, i think of it more of like you, you work more in, on the hip-hop track by trying to get the different little snippets to feel like they're different but they're all part of the same song and that doesn't mean that it gets depth so more like a um, an adele type of song right that was gonna that's gonna need much more depth than say like a um uh, a Kid Cudi song or 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 Jay Z track, right? So it's going to have different types of depth. So don't try to fit everything into the one box, and, and approach it from like that. Ask yourself, what does this song need in order to be the best version of this song that it needs? So when that happens, right? Um, I should say this too. This is the other thing about mixing that people don't understand is that I get the session from the client, and it has all the plugins that they've ever used on it still. I, they cannot remove anything. It has to be as they last touched it. So if they have reverbs picked out and delays and all that stuff already done, I want that in the session when I sit down to work from it. It would be like me undoing six months of their work and then having to recreate it you know, in a, in a couple of days. You, you'll never get there. So whenever I sit down to mix something, 
all of their reverbs and depths and everything that they've already selected is still in the session. I work from where they last touched it. So I'm working from their, their, from their basically from their reference mix on. So I'm not reinventing the wheel. So I, if they have good depth going on and it doesn't pop into my mind that that's a problem, I won't touch it. I won't add anything to it. I'll just use their reverbs and I'll just go in and work with the vocal. And I won't, I won't touch any of the reverbs. I'll leave them as is. Uh, if it is something that does pop into my mind, then, you know, I feel like maybe it needs a little bit of help of kind of like, you know, creating some of that depth. Then I'll, I'll pull up a reverb. But I don't do it every time. So sometimes you do a lot, little and sometimes you do a lot. Try not to try not to add stuff. Everything that you add should be for a reason of that creative star that I was talking about. Why did I add this reverb? Well, because I felt like I wasn't getting to Vegas. I felt like without this reverb, I was headed to Reno. And so that's why you put it on there. So don't just put it on there to try to feel what you perceive as like a, a box or what you think the mix is. Always stay true to that 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 a creative vision of what you have for the song. Obviously, you could go through there and add reverb to everything, but you should ask yourself, um, why? Why am I doing that? I always ask myself, why am I doing that? So if it's not, if the, and if the answer is not for that creative vision, then then I'm, I'm wasting time. I'm just doing it for my own ego. And that's not what we're hired to do as mixers. We're hired to serve at the artist's vision, so to speak. So if their vision is it's going to be swimming in reverb and very depth and those types of things, then I'll run with that and maybe I'll add in some some more depth to it. But if that's not in their vision, I don't put that into it simply because I think that's what makes a good mix. It's not your job to do that. That's a producer's job. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, Danny. So <laughs> you took the time to listen to the Loop Projects, correct? I did, yeah. Uh -huh. So obviously there are different problems in each one of them. But were there maybe three, because we only have a little bit of time left, were there maybe three areas where you think that during the rest of the semester that the students should maybe concentrate on um, when they're thinking about mixing their own projects like that? Yeah. Uh, so some of the things that, that popped out to me is, is loudness is still an elusive idea for a lot of you guys. Booner. It has to be loud. It has to be really, really loud. People don't want to hear weak, sonically appropriate mixes. They want to hear loud, good mixes is what they want to hear. So I would encourage you all, especially the people that are working on the projects, to really, really, really get serious about your limiting scheme. Like how, how loud can you push that mix without it distorting and breaking up? How loud can you get it without – I'm going to put my finger up here. How loud can you get it without it distorting and breaking up? How loud can you get it without destroying the vibe? And those are the two key elements. You should be able to get that song super, super loud – without distorting and without breaking the vibe. And to say so something on that real the, quick, because they use logic. Vibe is always the most difficult for people, and it's not something unique to you guys. That's just part of it. You just have to figure out how far you can go before it starts to break up, and then you pull it back from that breach. Um, just like a real quick thing before you go into the next couple of things. So in Logic, if you go to the master output stereo thing, there are just a couple of little presets that you can do. One of the most simple ones that does the least amount but brings the volume up probably the most is to just make it broadcast ready, right? So if you go to that, you click it, there's a disclosure thing of presets, and it'll say mastering, and you just go to that. So that's one way to do it. But what Delbert's saying is you'll see a bunch of different plugins there. Just mess around with them and see what's there. There's stuff that says rock master, ballad master, hip-hop master. From those, you can sort of see it. And they've got multipressors, which are compressors that affect certain frequency bands and things of that nature. Anyways, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead with the other two. Yeah, so you can you, you can hear on my little com my my um my limiter here. I have this I generally leave the output ceiling at 0. 0 is meaning like um what's the maximum volume you want for this? And some people will go in and change this. Like some of the super tedious people will go in and put 0 0.1. So they run it right under the 0, 0.0. I don't even do that. I I live in the world of loudness. So I keep it at zero. And really all you're doing with the limiting stuff is you're just sliding this fader up and down to figure out where's a good point for it to be. So I uh, probably don't have the frame rate for this, but let's just try it just in case.
We couldn't hear what you were saying over the music. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably can't hear me. So as that's playing, right, I'm looking at this attenuator, and I'm looking to see what the gain reduction uh, vo- uh, or amount is. So the more this goes down, right, the more I, I've got this threshold below. So the more I pull this threshold down, the crunchier and the grittier and the dirtier it's going to start to get. So the more you pull it down, you should start to think of, like, um, X ambassadors or Imagine Dragons or, like, a really dirty, gnarly, like Eminem, Rihanna type of thing. It starts to get this like really aggressive, distorted type of coloring that starts to happen to it. You lose all your punch once that starts to happen, right? So the more you pull this down, the more gritty and dirty and gnarly it's going to start to sound, but you're going to lose all the impact and all the punchiness. So I'm trying to figure out a way to pull this down so that I get the loudness, but depending on the track, right, it may it may call for the, for the growly graveliness uh, that this brings. But generally, I'm trying to pull this down without getting into that type of vibe. I'm trying to pull this threshold down so that so that it's doing a large amount of attenuation. Generally, zero to zero to three is generally kind of where mine seems to end up. Uh, without pulling it so far down that I start to lose definition in the bass and the kick, and it starts to get kind of gnarly. So that's what I'm working with when I'm working with the with the with the limiters and stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, actually, mine, I'll never let mine go below negative three, because as soon as it goes below negative three, you actually hear the compression. Yeah, exactly. I I don't want to hear the the compression. (laughs) I don't generally either. Some songs, that's part of the vibe of it, though, you know? Oh, yeah. The more you pull that threshold down, the more you start to hear that compressor, and that compressor becomes just, or that limiter becomes just as important as, like, an EQ would. It starts to color it and make it have a certain feel. Um but on, 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 on principle, I, I generally keep it zero to three. And recently I have found that even keeping it to zero to three is still not loud enough. So that's when I throw on another compressor or another limiter, sorry. Um, I use this Pro L quite a bit. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, and I'll do the same thing with it. So I'll have two limiters back to back on my stereo bus. And they'll both be doing uh, you know about three dBs of uh, re- attenuation to it. So I have two limiters doing the job that one of them can't. So I'll start to work with this. Yeah, come here. So I'll start to pull this gain up and down, and you'll see that the attenuator on, on, on this one works over here. So I'll start to work with that little slider there and start working with the, the Pro-L. Does that make sense, Mark? You agree with that? One hundred percent. Cool. What uh, What else besides volume? The other thing is clarity. I mean, some songs require clarity, and some of them don't. And it, it obviously that goes back to the whole vibe thing that I was saying. Uh, but <clears throat> if you listen to music done in the '90s, I want you to do this as homework. I want you to listen to Twenty One Pilots, any of the Heathen stuff or whatever, Blurry Face, any of that. And then I want you to, right back after you listen to that, I want you to go listen to, like, Nirvana and play them back to back. And tell me what the difference between the two songs are. What you'll notice, what you should notice, is that the level of clarity, even in rock and roll, has changed significantly to, like, the classics. So um, high frequency is where that comes in at. Everything 10K and above, that's where you should be spending a lot of time trying to interject as much as that as you can into your mixes without them being harsh and brittle. So high frequency is that's that is the key to modern music. If you go if you do that if you do that little project of listening to Heathens and then listen to Come As You Are back to back, you will be shocked at the differences of, of modern music, even in rock, versus to what it used to be in the nineties. Everything is has so much high frequency, so much sibilance in it now. Um, and that's just part of the modern sound of modern music. Because earbuds have destroyed the, the the ears of the children. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I will say this: higher frequency adds youthfulness to it. It adds uh, a sense of like um, confidence and like um, it adds like a feeling to it. And so, the more you can have that in there, the more people are going to enjoy listening to your music because that's more that's more used to what they're listening to. To me, to, to go back to her her question very first. The difference between a professional mix and a, a non-professional mix is the usage of that high-frequency stuff. High, professional mixes have 
a ton of high frequencies and different mixers have different versions or different amounts. And probably the guy that does it the best right now on the scene is Serban. And Serban just has his high frequency stuff. Just It's crystal clear up there. You can hear detail and it's not harsh in your ears. Uh, he has the game cornered on high frequency stuff right now. And if you if you go look up his discography, you know, the dude is just a powerhouse of, of songs. Like, Can you give a couple of examples? Oh, geez, I don't know. One year he won like four Grammys for all his stuff because he worked on so many projects. Ridiculous. Anything else? Those are the two that jumped out the most. Those were the two. And those are really tough to get. That requires a lot of listening and a lot of like kind of figuring out. Um, when I when you first start out, right, I would always encourage you to go to listen to, to music nowadays. So if you write a song that is maybe rock and roll and it reminds you of I geez, I can't even think of a rock band right now that's modern. I hate to say twenty one pies. <laughs> Let's try something else. So if you write a song and you're like, Oh, this is this is Mark's favorite artist, Ariana Grande, right? And you're like, it sounds, it reminds me of that. So you'll go, you should listen to that song and just flip back and forth between your mix and the and and her mix, and then ask yourself, how does mine sound different than hers, right? If you've written like an Ariana Grande type of song, you need to make it competitive. It needs to sound as good as her. It really does, and you can do that. You have all the tools that I have. The difference is I've been doing it longer, and I'm a total geek for it. So that's what, you know, that's the difference between the two. You have all the tools to make a mix. You can probably kill my mix real easily. Um, it just takes time and practice. But you need to compare it to something, I guess is my point in that, is that, yeah, it sounds good while you're listening to it, but then flip over and listen to something that has, you know, probably a $70,000 budget in 